Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We're so happy you could join us. You know, when we taped our last uh, show, I did really perfunctory types of introductions, and so let me start with Ken Risto. First of all, I would like you all to note, because there may be some questions for our audience at home, his heart is not bleeding. It's just a little, uh, a little stain there, so if you, we're just gonna call attention to it so that nobody has any He's serious questions. Here, right? <laughs> no, it's just ink. I it's can. very professional. I was actually at work today. Yeah. So involved in my work, I have blood yes, all over my hand. You can't see. You actually can't see. <laughs> Leave no pen behind. Yeah. Uh, Ken Risto is the... Not the simple. Is not a simple social studies no. teacher. No, no, by no means. He is the social studies curriculum and assessment development Special. coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> for the Sheboygan Area the School complex. District. <laughs> I wish. I Tom wish. Paneski has been at the University <clears throat> of Wisconsin Sheboygan campus for a good long time. Yep. And 38 years? 38 years. Really? So. Yeah. Congratulations. Older than the school? 39 yeah. years. 39 why, years. Probably, yeah. and, 25 for me. And he only looks like he's 45, so it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a Kids great thing. Kids keep you young. Yep. <laughs> uh, Cal Potter, former state senator, former high school teacher, former assistant superintendent for uh, libraries at the Department of Public Instruction. So it's a glorious group. Me, I'm a lawyer, and so this is fun for me. And we're talking uh, today, or in this uh, an episode... An esteemed barrister. An esteemed barrister. Um, talking about state issues, and um, but before we do that, because I forgot to mention this in our local segment, Bill Wongeman had a great article about Jerry Donahue in the Sunday paper, if I am not mistaken, and just a local boy, Jerry Donahue, his dad was one of the best known um, real estate surveyors and map makers in Sheboygan County, still has atlases that are state of the art uh, for people who do real estate uh, law in, in the county. But uh, former teacher Ron Glazer mm -hmm. called me and said, what is it about Jerry Donahue and DNA? Well, we did a little bit of research and found out that Jerry Donahue's son, Jerry Donahue, born in 1920, was one of the, along with Watson and? Crick. Crick, uh, a key player in, in discoveries related to DNA. And, um, and when Crick and Watson got their Nobel Prize, they, they acknowledged Jerry Donahue's huge contribution. I did had some fun doing a little bit of research, Google, thank goodness for Google. And um, so just a, a local boy who did very, very well, and uh, unfortunately, I think died of lung cancer, but uh, while he was uh, chair of the Department of Chemistry at UCLA, I think. But in any event, way to go, Sheboygan, and the Donahue is spelled correctly, so that's the important <coughs> piece of it. <laughs> well, on to less Another fun Irish things. success story. Yes, yeah. there have been at least four or five in the history of the world, so. Um, Saints be praised. Yeah, um, the state budget now. Journal Sentinel. Don't have one. <laughs> Don't have one. Next issue. Will we ever have issue one? Issue two. <laughs> Don't have one. But the bathrooms in the mm. uh, governor's mansion are getting a use that they haven't gotten in quite a long time. The governor is holed up with people there. Closed door uh, sessions. He's back. The governor's back. Back from? Well, he was overseas. China. Yes. He was back now. Okay. He is back now. Okay. And th that old budget, you know, this is... Uh, I thought it actually kind of a brilliant political move for Doyle to step in and try to, to save the Republicans and the Democrats from each other. Tom Paneski, we were talking about this a little earlier. No state budget, but fundraising is in full swing. Um, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign tells us that our friends uh, in the legislature have wasted $17.2 million uh, because uh, they haven't gotten the job done that they were supposed to have gotten done July 1st. Your thoughts? Will we ever have a budget? Where does the 17 million come from? I mean, uh, well, how, did, took, how did they waste it? They they just took <clears> the the budget that the the legislature would have for a year and divided by four, which is 17.1 million. That was well, the methodology. It's been a little bit like the mayor saying we're not going to have a tax increase. The Republicans said we're not going to have a tax increase, and the Democrats proposed a huge tax increase. So they're at loggerheads. Thank goodness, in the long run, I think the, uh, our state, not like other states, can continue. Uh, some other states, like Michigan, had to close down because they couldn't uh, reach a budget. Uh, and then when everything closes down, they, under the gun, they have to vote. 
So until we settle our philosophical differences, uh, we could continue. And for, you know, it's going to cause pressure on different agencies, but I think maybe we need to reorganize. Mm -hmm. And that could cause reorganization. We have so many levels of government, village, city, county. At one point it was proposed to kind of, you know, get rid of some of those levels and blend them into maybe just a county government and uh, maybe a city government. That's it. You know, instead of, but with all these levels of government, uh, no wonder. Was that the kettle? Was that the kettle commission? Yeah, that report was the kettle commission that you're referring to. I think it was. Was it? It talked about consolidation. Yeah, exactly. of consolidation. Yeah, maybe levels. you know. Again, mm. we you know, and even we have taxing agencies, the technical schools, the school districts. We got. We got a lot of tax districts, huh? sanitary districts. Yeah, the so. Milwaukee San. Well, it's just so many. Yes. So you know, this puts pressure on a lot of people. If we just continue funding people it last love, year, people love their town governments. I know. You go I to know. the town of Lima. You can actually talk to your, to, know. you know, to the guys that are sitting behind the table, and they're actually listening. And uh, I think uh, people love their government here, their own specific levels, but. What we've got is a Republican Assembly and a Democratic Senate. Surely there have been those problems in the past, and it hasn't led to a complete impasse. I, you know, it, I think this budget impasse is less on philo philosophy than it is trying to expose the other party as being incompetent, posing for the next election. In other words, the Senate, being now Democrat, is a completely... Uh, rubbing the Republicans the wrong way because they had control of the Senate for the last couple of years and they want to make the uh, Democrats seem like they're having immense tax increases when they're not suggesting in reality anything but mostly fee increases including the health care plan which is, was rolled into this but they're not talking about a sales tax increase or an income tax increase they're talking about a lot of fees in many states fees finance much of state government making the people who use the service pay for the service. That's not something that's unusual. So when you look at uh, the rhetoric, so many dollars per person the tax rate is going up, it's more or less trying to paint the Democrats as being people who are not friendly to the average person's pocketbook. And they're all staging this month, week after week, month after month, because they want to make sure that every man, woman, and child in this state hates Democrats. But the problem is you've got school districts and you've got municipalities and all kinds of folks who ought to have shared revenues and school aids and all the things that are in that budget taken care of by the people who were elected to take care of it. And the problem with the governor calling these kids in to his, his mansion and saying let's, let's uh, resolve this is that they're going to have to resolve it anyhow in the legislature and you might as well do it now than later. And so it's really totally irresponsible for the Republicans to say, well, the Democrats can pass school aids or shared revenues or any little part of that budget and solve an immediate major crisis, but the rest of the budget shouldn't even be tackled. That's a bunch of baloney. That whole budget could be settled and should be settled. And what the Republicans have to realize is that they do not have the Senate. They do not have the governorship. They only have one-third of the equation, and when you're only one-third of the equation, sometimes you have to sit down and you have to compromise. That's the way it is. When I was in a minority, I was in, in 90, 95 sessions, so on, we had to sit down and we had to compromise because we knew we didn't have the votes, and sometimes you have to go with hat in hand and say, we're going to have to settle this because uh, I know you guys control <clears throat> the process. I know you, you, you can call the shots, but we're willing to sit down and see what we can work out. That's what has to happen, but it's really on the basis, it's politics, trying to paint the, the Democrats as so averse that the next go around, the governor is Republican, the Senate goes back to the Republicans, and the majority in the, in the assembly goes back to a greater margin than the close margin that now exists. Now, that's fine. I'm not saying the Democrats don't have the same desire to have majorities, but that wears thin after a while because you're, not, you're taking statesmanship in, in public service and throwing it out the window and saying the next election is the most important thing. And it isn't to people who are on school boards or municipalities or people who expect uh, homestead property tax relief. There are constituencies out there in the thousands that deserve better from the legislature than they're getting. End of speech. 
That was a good speech. Uh, hey, somebody's awake here. I just thought of I just thought of when the Democrats controlled the Senate prior to when the Republicans controlled the Senate. I forget who was the the majority leader. I, didn't he get sent to jail or something for kickbacks and bribes and everything? They, they both did. They both did. <laughs> they yeah. both. Well, it wasn't <laughs> the Republican person. and the. But and it was, was it yeah. split again? So it, they rotate back and forth. <laughs> and amazingly enough, in spite of their leadership going to jail, we still have. People who, as the, the Journal Sentinel editorial said, budget is stalled, but fundraising is in, in full blossom. Uh, you, you know, there are outings, there are golf tournaments, there are dinners. You know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a fundraiser, and um, it's, it's, it's interesting to and, me. And someone said other legislation gets held up, is that it? They won't do other legislation until the budget settled? Well, they've tried to pull out. I mean, the Republicans have tried to pull out. No, I mean, just other legislation unrelated to the budget. Well, no, they can. They can, but in many cases, there are there are items that need to have fiscal notes, and you really don't. Oh, you know, okay, with the fiscal. Yeah. It's very difficult to pass uh, an item that is going to fit into total state budget when you don't have a state budget. budget. You know. Okay, I see. Yeah, that's how it works. And yeah. the state budget should have been resolved in, in July one. That's the problem. All right, everybody's hopped up here. What about you? Well, I'm interested. Well, I'm just interested. Before I get hopped up about anything, <laughs> I'm just interested from an historical perspective. Was there more of an inclination or an understanding when you were there, Cal, that um, you know someday we're going to be in the minority, so it pays to at least find you know to, to leave a little bit of something on the table for the other guy, so that when the tables are turned, they'll treat us the same way we treated them. Was I mean when you talked about being in the minority? Did you have to go two thirds of the way in that, or were the, were, was there really a recognition that you know someday we know we're going to well, be there? In the almost 24 years that I spent in the legislature, uh, there never was a scenario where the governor at the mansion mm -hmm. had a group of legislators to get together. It, it was, it was, we had conference committees, and they would meet either mm -hmm. in the parlor of the Senate or the parlor of the Assembly. Republicans on one side, Democrats on the other side, and you would sit and you <coughs> trade. And you'd, you'd split babies and you'd uh, trade cats and whatever you had to do in order to uh, resolve the issue. Mm -hmm. And eventually, uh, if you got to an impasse on something, they, you simply told the staff, "Put the, remember, we'll take this up tomorrow. Let's go on to the next issue and see if we can get an agreement on this. And you did this week after week sometimes in order to get an agreement. And that's what really should be taking place between these legislators. But you've got a lot of, particularly in, in the assembly, you've got a lot of people who philosophically think of partisan politics as more important than what they're doing to the people of Wisconsin. I mean, you can play this game, I think, up to the time of October. And then after October, it's hardball because the school boards and all everybody else right. who needs to print a property tax bill has, should have an answer. And that's when the Republicans uh, at this stage need to say that we do have to compromise and the Democrats have to compromise. Both sides have to compromise. The health care plan will probably have to be taken out. That's its understanding. And, and there are a number of things in here that are, you're just going to have to uh, throw out or compromise on and split the baby and some fee increases are going to have to be agreed to well, by what concerns the Republicans. Me, yeah, what concerns me is, uh, because I listen to Wisconsin Public Radio, is I don't know if this went on in your day, but this negotiating in public where there seems to be microphones and they're having the conversation, the dialogue with the media present. And I'm all for open government, but I also recognize that sometimes statesmanship requires to go behind closed doors and say, okay, you know, I can't get everything I want. You can't get everything that you want. I got public, you know, pressure groups on my side, you know, that write campaign checks for mm -hmm. me and you've got the same situation. I recognize that, but the state needs a budget. And what I see is posturing in front of the microphones where they literally are having a conversation with, I mean, it's as if like the conference committee is almost um, having the discussion or the, the, the actual process of negotiation going on in public where in the glare of the camera lights, who's going to you know, make that first step and say, oh, we gotta find some common ground here without looking well, weak? Well, a, a lot of that, when you did have a conference committee and you didn't have the scenario now where the governor calls people in, is uh, the majority leader in one house would sit, just go off in the corner with the majority leader in the other say, what if we did this? What if I gave you this and you gave me this? Right. And then they went back to the table and they kind of looked at each other and says, I propose this and the other one says, yeah, I think that's kind of a nice idea. And then the other people who were, uh, you didn't have a majority of the committee, so uh -huh. this is perfectly legal. So yeah, those type of things went in, uh, went on without the need for the microphones and so on. Right. But to, for the governor to have to play uh, parent here and sort of get the little children into the, into the, the big house to, to get them to, uh, to sit down and talk, 
I, I, that's kind of unusual, and I, I think it's the legislature is failing by having the governor now start to, to control things. Well, well, and he's not even perceived as he's not even perceived as a neutral parent in with two kids that are squabbling here. So I'm wondering what kind of effectiveness he's going to bring to that role of some, finding some common ground. Well, yeah, and, and what I'm wondering is what when. When they are in that scenario where you get a Democratic governor and you've got the Democratic Senate and then you have, obviously, in the governor's mansion, less Republicans, when that document, which will be eventually a compromise document, gets back to that Republican assembly with a lot of these conservatives who have been posing for holy pictures and, and really saying, we're never going to have any type of tax increase, what type of votes are going to be there for that compromise document? I mean. That could be another crisis. It's mm -hmm. going to be interesting to see how many will, uh, will will really swallow hard and say, I guess we need a budget and I will vote for this compromise package after they have stipulated that they're not going to vote for any type of uh, compromise yeah. package. I mean, I know we're playing budgetary chicken here, but we've been at the district. We're already now Libby Burmeister today. Um, the state superintendent of public schools started telling school districts, don't plan on the state aids that you necessarily yeah. thought were coming. And yeah. we're starting the war game today. Yeah. War game, looking at our budgets and saying, where are we not going to spend money where we thought we could spend money, given that you've got all of your yeah. teachers locked in labor contracts? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not no that the Republicans are uh, irresponsible. They proposed a budget. They planned, they worked together and proposed a budget in the assembly. It disagree, <clears throat> you know, and they're ready to go with that budget, but there's uh, another budget in the Senate which is different. I mean, it's the governor's budget. So what happens then? There has to be. So a yeah, but but it's you know they're, they're not just holding out for no taxes. They said we were going to propose a budget without any tax increases, and they proposed a budget. It's not like we're just not going to sure. vote and for something. And it's very. I mean, they could have proposed a budget with that. And they cut, thought it was reasonable. They could have cut half the budget and said we've proposed this very reasonable budget that's going to save everybody six hundred dollars a year, and it's very irresponsible of the Democrats not to accept this altogether. But. It's, it's they, they weren't, they were, you know, while they were playing politics, they knew they had to have a budget, so they, they put one together. Two things, though, that I want to just touch on, if I can. The, the, the health care plan in, in the Senate is pretty comprehensive. It's pretty expensive. It really does give people insurance. And I'm the lawyer who sees people every week who do not have access to health care. Those people are out there. I see them all the time. And it's, it's pretty much a tragedy from my perspective. But... Do you think that the Senate Democrats are going to be willing to compromise or pull back, or is that health care plan going to come out altogether in order to make the budget work? I think it'll come out, but to try to get agreement from the Republicans to set up a, some type of a, uh, forum for that bill to be taken up at, on its own merits or some other type of provisions that sets the stage for it, maybe a task force or something to, to not to abandon it completely. We should get, I think, a couple people on the show at some point representing the different different parts of the spectrum in terms of of um, guaranteeing health care access for everybody. Because I think, as we've talked about on this show 10 years ago, this would be called socialized medicine. Now, I mean, we realize that there are lots of people who don't have access to health care, and that's what they need. So, so I'm interested, because I think the Democrats' plan is pretty comprehensive and Absolutely. needs to be scaled back if... You know, 20 years from now, it may be just pretty normal, but for now, it's pretty pretty revolutionary. Second thing, though, that I wanted to talk about, and we just we don't have a whole lot of time left, but as I understand, Wisconsin is now the only state left whose budget expires on July 1st that doesn't have a budget. So you know, we're you know the the goose is standing alone here. Would it be sensible for um, Wisconsin to put itself in the position of a drop dead date like we just like the state of Michigan just went through like the federal government goes through and maybe you can have continuing resolutions and so forth but actually draw the line in the sand and say instead of going to the governor's mansion <coughs> services are going to stop and we're going to kick 1500 people out of the state parks and uh, non-essential services will shut down I mean it, it certainly worked for Bill Clinton <laughs> against Newt Gingrich back in 94, hmm, in 94, um, would that make sense here so that people really had a real deadline instead of just the, I mean, they have a deadline now in terms of tax bills and, I mean, things are getting serious, but I just wonder if it would make some sense. 
Well, I think it would bring about uh, a lot of outrage from the public. But the governor was asked this question on, on the news yesterday, and he basically said, at this stage of the game, the people who suffer are the people who want to use the parks or want to get their driver's license or whatever. He says, they didn't <coughs> cause this problem. It's the politicians in the state capitol who can't sit down like big boys and girls and settle this issue. He said, why should I at this stage inflict pain on people who are disabled or whatever their need for government service happens to be? And I think he's right. Um, the problem, I think, is if partisanship gets to be too poisonous, um, if the governor indeed does say we're going to shut, shut down our driver uh, uh, licensure stations and so on, um, people get all upset and mad. And what the Republicans will simply say is, well, he didn't have to do that. We can continue on last year's budget. And so the partisan politics is, oh, that's a dirty governor doing something he didn't have to do. So you know, that's what I'm saying is partisan politics is fine up to a point. Then it becomes a, 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 a useless, punitive, poisonous game. And that's why I think people on both sides of the aisle have to say, yes, the Republicans do control the Assembly, the Democrats do control the Senate, and both of you folks have to sit down and compromise. You need to have half a loaf on most of these issues, not the full loaf. And we haven't come to that point yet. We're still seeing people saying it's either my way or the highway. And that's, that's what I think has gone wrong on a federal level and on a state level, is partisan politics has become supreme mm -hmm. rather than eventually saying, we do owe it to the public who elected us to provide a certain level of service and funding. We can have our politics and we'll play the politics game up until October, but after that, let's, let's settle this issue. And that hasn't happened and that isn't happening. I mean, I could concur with that. I think there also should be a cap on, on any budget increase. A, a few states have caps. And then it's just how do we order our priorities within that cap? Because right now we could just, one side could go very high and the other side doesn't do anything. And, uh, but if you had a cap, then it's reorganizing priorities. So you still have a deadline and then you just have to reorganize, what, what are you going to spend that money on? And there'll be different priorities for different groups, and then you've got to bargain and settle that. Well, and of course, legislatures impose caps on, on municipalities and on, on school districts, but uh, not on itself. And, uh, well, and so See, and I happen, I happen to think we ought to, I mean, right now, you're absolutely right, the governor has a choice whether he wants to shut down uh, non-essential services or not, and he's going to walk into that trap, and who's going to walk into that trap? But if you legislatively didn't give the sides an option, that on a certain date, non-essential services, define them as you want to. Um, and I would, you know, not that I want the days off, but I would actually would talk about shutting schools down or one day of the week or whatever it takes to get That's your budgets in alignment. Take, rather than the governor's right. Yeah. And then you simply say, and, you, and that then people are confronted with the reality that, you know, we really do want government services and, and that'll provide the, the political, the, unfortunately, sadly, but I think the reality is that's the only way you're going to get people to step away from the small and narrow interest groups that may be pressuring t politicians in these locked. Then they can go back and say, look, the public's screaming, we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. It's a sad state of affairs, but I think that's probably the only, the only way they're going to get a, a budget here is have a gun to their head. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hate that metaphor, but um, I think that's going to have to happen. And I think they ought to think about doing something along those lines by October 1st. And I think the, the, the public and politicians need to review what a tax is as well. Um, I view taxes as things that are inflicted upon everyone. The sales tax, the excise tax, well, it's just <coughs> somewhat selective. Um, the income tax. I think the fees that are often increased, which is really the bulk of the increases that are in this budget, are in most states very heavily relied upon. I had a friend who I talked to on the phone the other day, licensed her car in North Carolina, it was 200 some dollars. Uh, she had to get an emissions test. She had to go to a private garage and pay for it by herself. And so the total of bill that she had for licensing her car for that year was $300. What is it in Wisconsin? 45 And you have your car tested over in the industrial park for nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are states that rely very heavily on fees. And when the, the legislature starts going in that direction, I think there, there needs to be more enlightenment, I think, or more fair play in saying some of these fees are justifiable. 
maybe lawyers should pay for the license that, that, that they get, or a doctor, or maybe real estate transfer fees should pay we for do. the. For, <laughs> but I'm just saying that in many cases, fees that are, are increased substantially are to help pay for the agency that regulates that profession or that activity. And uh, oftentimes, to go through a budget and add up all these fee increases and say, like some of the partisan rhetoric that's coming out today, that there's going to be a tax increase for every man, woman, and child in the mm -hmm. state of $1,900 or something, um, <clears throat> really isn't a fair portrayal of the debate that we ought to be having about how do we finance government in the first place. And what do we consider, as Tom points out, to be essential services? Sure. Yeah, and there's a gas tax. Is mm -hmm. that a fee? Well, look, in the Thompson <laughs> administration, there was an enormous prison building program um, that was hugely expensive. And um, we now incarcerate about 25% more people than Minnesota does. And it's very costly. That's how we determined that we were going to spend our money in the Thompson administration. Um, and highways, I think. He was, and, he was concrete, the concrete governor. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, it is, tax policy is all about how you order your social needs and, and what's important to you and so forth. So, so it's interesting uh, to me. Um, I think one of the first rules that we could start with, though, is to prohibit fundraising during the budget cycle. Oh, I definitely. And um, I think that that is, along with public financing of judicial campaigns, we won't have much time to talk about that, but the State Bar of Wisconsin's new president, Tom Basting, is interested in really pushing lawyers to, to you know, bring forward the idea of, of public financing, even of just Supreme Court races. We now have Justice Ziegler, who is going to be disciplined in one fashion or another by the Supreme Court. Justice Prosser cannot participate in that because he was a significant financial supporter of hers. I mean, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a bad system, and how and how all of that gets worked out. I think. Um, I mean, those to me are the the issues where people could really start to come together and talk about just a. There's a nothing, good public policy. A good public policy, and as you said, there's nothing wrong with partisanship. I mean, partisanship is is the it's been spice there of since life. This country <laughs> it, it, and, it, and it pushes so Hamilton and Je Jefferson <laughs> glared at each other <laughs> across <laughs> the table. Yes, <laughs> exactly, and 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 had, has pushed that process forward. So nothing wrong with that. It's just that we're just seeing some sort of extreme morphing of it, and uh, and it's too bad. So we'll have to stay tuned. Time to leave, but thanks all for a good conversation. <laughs>